Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today, and welcome to this CM Crossroads webcast series event. Harnessing Team Ingenuity, Lessons from Aviation, Psychology, and Jazz. This webcast is brought to you by CMC Media and CM Crossroads, and is sponsored by CollabNet. I'm Patrick Egan, publisher of CM Crossroads and the Agile Journal, and I'll be your moderator today for this webcast. In a few moments, Michael James will join us to discuss some of the research gained outside the world of software that would benefit anyone working in small development teams. But before we get, begin, let me take care of a few housekeeping details. Our webcast is intended to be interactive, so you can ask a question at any time by using the chat box you can see below the webcast screen. Uh, you'll also notice that you can pop out the uh, the chat box so that it doesn't get hidden behind the slides by using the little pop-up button you can see down there at the bottom right corner of the screen as well. If you'd like to share your thoughts about today's event, you can use the Twitter and Facebook links above the slides to share. A tweet roll panel will show you today's active comments on the right side of the screen as well. And uh, if you'd like your comments to appear there, make sure you use the hashtag CMCLC, and that way you'll show up in the tweet roll. Also, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you can click on the Resources tab on the right side of the screen, and then click on Presentation Download. This will uh, download a copy of today's presentation in PDF so that you can follow along if there's any troubles with the uh, video uh, display above. Also, so you can have a copy to take home. Also, if you ever need to get a closer look at any slide, just mouse over the um, uh, presentation viewer here and click on the full button and that will expand the screen to uh, the full size of your browser window. And again, a copy of uh, a, broad a um, recording of today's broadcast, including the Q&A session, will be available for on-demand replay within 24 hours so that you can listen to it again or recommend it to a friend. Well, let me introduce our speaker today. Michael James is a software process mentor and a recovering architect at CollabNet. And uh, uh, he's been a software process mentor and team coach and scrum trainer with a focus on engineering practices that allow agile project management practices. Uh, he's also a software developer, um, recovering software architect, as he call him, calls himself, who still loves uh, good design. His programming experience dates back to the late 70s and includes control systems for aircraft and spacecraft, some of the most uh, deterministic, high-quality systems ever built. So, uh, Michael, if you're ready to go, I think uh, we'll turn it over to you, and the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Patrick. So, uh, this is me. You heard enough about me. You can reach me. Uh, here at any time, mj scrum at gmail.com, and I do hope you keep in touch with me. That's my favorite kind of webinar. And I also hope that you'll, uh, as Patrick su suggested, there's a chat window where you can uh, talk to each other. Um, at various times, I'll be asking you questions. And you do you learn more by, by writing than you do by reading and listening. So if you want to retain, you make the best use of your time here, I encourage you to you know, type things into that chat window. You, other things which may be interesting to you, there's a Scrum reference card, it's free, uh, it's sponsored by Collabnet, and there's a Scrum Master's checklist, which is also free. And these things have been downloaded, um, I guess, about 10,000 times by now. Some of them have been translated into other languages as well. And contact me if you need them in other languages. Part of Collabnet, uh, which is, uh, let me back up here again, uh, which, is, uh, which does a lot of things. Uh, we do technical consulting, things like this webinar, for instance. Our favorite thing to do, of course, is just to go to your place and help you do the agile practices, and particularly Scrum, or using Scrum as a framework for improving your agility. And we've got some tools as well. Scrum Works is uh, something you may have heard of before. Very likely you've heard of Subversion. And uh, that's enough advertising. In fact, I am wearing this hat at the moment. I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't do the webinar without wearing the hat. And the topic, how do we get from pure productivity? During the previous century, we were obsessed with productivity. Uh, and we were able to do things like build lots of things. This is the next century now, and that's not going to be enough. Just building stuff is not going to be nearly enough. We need to uh, build new things. We need to innovate. And that requires ingenuity. It takes more than just doing the same thing uh, a lot of times. A different part of the brain, a different part of our 
a different way of using our organizations and teams uh, is crucial. And I, I suppose that's why you're on this webinar. You know that already. We're going to take this in three parts. We're going to look at uh, performance and ingenuity at the individual level. And we'll look at it at the team level. And then we'll, a little bit, uh, there won't be a lot of time, we'll look at it at the organizational level. First, we'll look at the individual. Uh, first thing, when we think about the ingenuity in one person, uh, first thing we usually think about is intelligence. And how do we measure intelligence typically? Well, traditionally, we've, done, we've used IQ for that. Uh, does IQ measure useful intelligence? Uh, well, kind of. Uh, IQ does predict how well you do in school, and it seems to predict how well you'll do at novel tasks, which we'll have, be having more and more of in the future. Uh, but there are some surprises around this. It's not completely linear. In fact, a uh, scientist with an IQ of 130 is just as likely to win the Nobel Prize as a scientist who, whose IQ is 180. And maybe you've actually observed this firsthand. People who are extremely uh, smart in, in analytical reasoning, uh, but not necessarily creative. Now, so, so beyond the per a certain shelf, there's a certain threshold. Uh, IQ is making less of a difference uh, than you would expect, uh, but it is you know, some amount of it is necessary, and the amount that, that it contributes will probably increase over time as we get into the new century, the new kind of work. Here's what Dilbert has to say about that. IQ is a decent predictor of performance on unfamiliar tasks. It, it's interesting that there are chess grandmasters with IQ below 100. Uh, they're doing the same game over and over again. As the world changes and the kind of work we do gets more out of, into this chaotic realm where there's uncertainty about both the requirements and the technology, in other words, this is the sweet spot for approaches like Scrum where there's empirical feedback, uh, I think it will start to matter more. So other than intelligence, what what governs the way individuals act? Uh, personality. How do we measure personality? Uh, you're probably familiar with this uh, Myers-Briggs personality indicator. That, that's not the thing that uh, personality researchers and psychologists actually use. Personality researchers uh, generally use a thing called the Big Five Traits, or the uh, five-factor model of personality. And this is something something you can uh, look up on your own. We'll go through it briefly here. There are five different traits uh, which have been discovered empirically. So they're they are real personality traits. Uh, some of them are physically measurable, in fact. One of those traits is extroversion, tolerance of stimulation from people and situations. I've got a, a baby. Actually, she's one year old now. And when she was a newborn, uh, what she did, you know, everyone has a certain amount of, toler of sensory stimulation that they can tolerate from people in situations. And it's really obvious in babies because they can't move their eyes, so what they have to do is turn their head. So if, the, for instance, a, a newborn is overstimulated by the social interaction, uh, my daughter would turn her head away from that. If you ignore that, then she'll start crying. Uh, by the way, these traits, uh, people's personalities generally don't change very much. I'm saying it never happens, but it generally doesn't happen a whole lot. Some other things about extroverts. In a study, which I'll talk to you about later on, extroverts were perceived as more technically competent. So that's not necessarily good news for us introverts, is it? Also, uh, extroverts, extroversion tends to decrease between ages 20 and 30. So personality doesn't change a lot, usually, uh, but there are some shifts. Another of those traits is agreeableness, which is kind of what it sounds like. Some people tend to agree more easily than others. Some people tend to go along. You know, some people tend to conform more uh, in a discussion. They'll yield more easily. Other people, as a general tendency, as a general personality tendency, are more like the guy on the right. Uh, Gordon Gecko, obviously a disagreeable person, not, not easily agreeing to things. Uh, we'll talk about how this plays into teamwork later on. Good news is that people tend to become more agreeable with time. Another trait, conscientiousness. Some people have a greater tendency to 
to need achievement, to strive for achievement. And this is an internal yardstick. So they have an internal desire uh, to achieve things. Other people are further from that. For instance, Wally, Gilbert again, uh, people that are, don't seem to have any ambition or don't seem to uh, want to uh, achieve as much. And there's a whole, all of these traits are gradients. There's a spectrum from you know, extreme conscientiousness to, to less of it. Uh, my favorite book about conscientiousness, that goes into this traits more. Uh, actually, it's, let's check on the next slide. Talent is overrated. So if you're interested in uh, high performance, I would really encourage you to read this book. Uh, do you think that Mozart and Tiger Woods uh, were just born with lots of natural talent? Uh, turns out not. They were they worked hard on it uh, from the time they were very young with good coaching, and they engaged in this thing called deliberate practice. So deliberate practice means we look at everything as practice for the next time we do it. Some people have a greater tendency to do that. Other people have a lesser tendency, and this tends to increase between ages 20 and 30. Again. The important thing here is it's consistency with their self-image. So it's something they're driving. It's an internal standard. Another trait is neuroticism. People have a, which is the opposite of emotional stability. So some people have a greater uh, enduring tendency to experience negative emotional states. Like C-3PO is, is easily stressed out, so frightened easily. Uh, tendency to experience negative emotional states, uh, which will lead to fearful or violent reactions. Uh, other people have a greater tendency to stay calm, so the opposite is emotional stability. Yoga or James Bond would be examples of, of uh, the archetype, you know, never breaking a sweat, the whole world's exploding, people are shooting at you, but still you know, staying on an emotional even keel. The racism tends to decrease, by the way, between ages 20 and 30. Yes, you're a New York 20-year-old. That's probably good news. And then this is the one trait which they're not able to physically measure, but they're uh, very certain shows up. So all the differences in personality are some combination of these uh, differences among these five different traits, which each one's a spectrum. Uh, open, so some people have a greater tendency, uh, uh, a need for novelty, you know, greater novelty-seeking behavior or tendencies. Other people have a greater preference for familiar things. Uh, Lance Pauling was an example of someone who's uh, obviously you know interested in the unknown. It wasn't purely and Linus Pauling, who we're showing here, uh, wasn't as a child. He, he was a smart kid, but it wasn't that he showed great intellect. It's that he was curious about everything. So some combination of the openness to experience and conscientiousness, internally curious about these things, naturally driven, intrinsically driven to learn things, uh, is what made him a uh, you know, a star scientist. So if you're in the chat room now, uh, which of these traits do you remember? Which ones do you tend to, to stick in which ones tend to stick in your mind? Type the ones that you can think of. I'm not going to wait too long because a lot of slides to get through. Short time. Well, I'll let you do that on your own. Uh, how does this relate to performance, these five traits? Uh, there's another aspect of performance, which is, uh, it's been called flow. Uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi uh, wrote a book called Flow. It's kind of a long, wandering book, but it's probably the, the, one of the best uh, explanations of this phenomenon. High performers get into this flow. Uh, it, it's a natural absorption in the task. So you see this, this little boy, he's, he's drawn into the work. It takes more effort for him to stop working on this thing than it does for him to keep working. You are, um, you, if, if you're a software developer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you lose track of time, typically, when you're, when you're in this flow state. Uh, you're just drawn into the work. The work is intrinsically rewarding. You get satisfaction just purely from the work itself, not necessarily uh, something you're doing in order to do something else. What are the conditions for flow? So we have a combination of effortless attention, 
clear goals. So they have to be goals that we, where we can observe our progress towards these goals, and they're goals that have meaning for us. It's all about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And this is going to help us get into the, this flow state, or create the environment where flow can happen. Uh, now, Scrum, of course, it's the Scrum Master's responsibility to create the environment where, the, where team flow can occur later on. Clear, meaningful goals. So, of course, if we're doing Scrum, we want clear goals for our team. Immediate feedback from the activity encourages flow. This is part of why video games are so addictive. Uh, we get immediate feedback about how we're doing. We can see our skills improving a little bit at a time. Uh, and that tends to lead to flow. It tends to lead to that flow state. It's almost like a hypnotic state. And also, high challenges met with high skills. So if the challenges are too great for our skills, then we're not in flow. We're frustrated or we're anxious. If the challenges are too low for our skills at the time, then we're bored. Another piece of flow is autonomy, task autonomy. So which of these dogs do you think is in the flow state right now? Not the one on the left, right? This dog is able to progress at its own speed. And so think about your work environment again and which things are encouraging uh, this kind of state versus this kind of state. And think about what is the Scrum Master's role in creating an environment uh, where, where people have control over the way that they do their work. There's another part of this is which, which is motivation. A lot of misconceptions about motivation. We'll tackle one of them head on here. Do conditional incentives increase your problem solving ability? What do I mean by conditional incentives? So you know, if you do this, then you get that. So where someone's going to give you a little piece of cheese or uh, zap you with an electric shock if you don't do it. So conditional incentives. And this is uh, B.F. Skinner is a person who just discovered, or I, I guess is best known for just studying behaviorism. And it turns out that this works for simple work, for simple tasks. You can elicit simple behavior from animals and, and even people uh, if you give them a, a little chit, you know, give them a little uh, reward, a little piece of food, a little bribe, a little uh, performance reward, maybe uh, a bonus, if they do the thing you want them to do. And it works for simple tasks. The problem is now we're doing complex work. Now that we're doing complex work, uh, a different approach to motivation uh, becomes more important. In fact, incentives are actively harmful. Uh, the, this conditional incentives are actively harmful uh, for people's ability to do hard work. There are two different factors. One is the effect on motivation, and the other is if the, the tendency to shut down the other parts of the brain that we need. Uh, you will experience almost literal tunnel vision. Uh, you'll actually lose the ability to see, to do the lateral thinking uh, if you're driven purely by uh, an incentive. This is different than measurable goals, so we have to keep track of these different, different things. Uh, in one of these experiments, they actually went to a village in rural India and offered people uh, differing amounts of money, up to uh, 800 rupees, which, you know, which, which is not a lot of money for us, like 20 bucks. Uh, but uh, in a rural village, a rural farming village in India, uh, that might be as much money as a person would, would spend in an entire month. And it turned out they did worse. The higher the incentive, the worse the performance on complex types of work. Uh, there was only one exception. Uh, the one exception was having people type two letters together, the letter B and the letter V on the keyboard as fast as they can. So in that case, the higher incentive led to better performance. So part of it is the ability to, to uh, or the tendency to uh, overactivate uh, the simple task doing part of our minds and deactivate the other parts that we need for complex work, for complex and analytical work. The other part is the effect on motivation. Alfie Cohn is someone who's looked at this quite a bit. Uh, so if you're open to the possibility uh, that um, these might be, these practices might be harmful, might be harming your organization, uh, then there are you know, other things you can uh, look into. This whole field of behavioral economics 
uh, contradicts the assumptions of classical economics because classical economics, uh, the idea that people are rational pursuers of economic gain, uh, doesn't explain things, doesn't explain Wikipedia, it doesn't explain Linux, uh, doesn't explain people you know, joining the Navy and wanting to be on a submarine crew, uh, the hardest kind of work with the lowest kind of pay and the least uh, extrinsic type of reward. So here's a discussion point for you. A couple of you have discovered the chat room. See that? Uh, for you, why don't you either ideally type or at least think about uh, what's a good day at work? What are some of the elements of a good day at work? What are some of the elements of a bad day at work? What's different about a bad day at work first than a good day? Think about some concrete examples of a good day for you. <laughs> Only one thing breaks. Yeah, a good day has no meetings. Has fewer meetings anyway. <laughs> a good day, sense of satisfaction at the end. Yeah, solved a tough problem. Uh, enjoyed the people I worked with. Yeah, no interruptions. Versus a bad day has fire drills, right? You weren't able to do what you set out to do. You were impeded in your progress. Yeah, protection from distractions. <laughs> yeah, fewer in things, emails in my inbox than on the other out day. Yeah, sense of accomplishment, sense of reward at the end of it, just from doing the work itself. Now, people know this about themselves. Uh, but they assume that other people are different, especially managers. They ask managers these questions, and they said, well, well I'm, of course, I'm motivated by getting things done, uh, but the people who work for me, I think I need to bribe them to make them interested in their work. But they asked people, well, what makes you feel satisfied with your work? And just about everyone said, you know, it's progress. And the interesting part is that people didn't know that about other people tend to assume other peoples are less noble than we are, perhaps. So that's a bit about uh, the individual, performance in the individual. Uh, we're going to talk about how that plays in the team environment yet, because individual occurs in the context of a team, which occurs in the context of the organization. And why is, why is it important? Why is this so important to us now? Um, I'm, Aren't all these breakthroughs made by individuals? Now, aren't scientific breakthroughs and all the progress of our humans, hasn't that all been done by lone geniuses? Uh, where did that myth come from? The idea that uh, one person would be responsible for these breakthroughs in a vacuum. Uh, pretty much all the people that you might think of uh, that made these breakthroughs, attribute it to other people. You know, they're all basing their work on other people. One way or another, there's some type of collaboration involved in their in that knowledge creation process and that, and that in those innovations. Now, what harms team ingenuity? And this is a huge issue for Scrum especially if you're in a scrum team. Uh, three different types of behavior. One person's able to completely shut down uh, the performance of a team. Uh, can you think, actually I'd like you to type this. Uh, what are some behaviors that cause team, one person to be able to sabotage a whole team? seen this firsthand. You've observed it firsthand. Acting like a no no uh, treating other team members with disrespect. The attitude, yeah, being overly critical, critical in a harmful way. So negative behavior. 
this was really interesting. We studied how teams, there's, we can measure collective intelligence of a team, or there are people do experiments where they try to measure the collective intelligence. And the team collective intelligence was not determined by IQ primarily. Uh, the team's, the group intelligence was dictated more by the social sensitivity. So how, how, since, how well are people listening to each other in the team environment? And this is also interesting. Teams with female members uh, tended to do a little better at collective intelligence because on average the uh, women, on average, uh, are higher in social sensitivity. They've got more of that peripheral vision. They're paying more attention to what's going on. Uh, so a high-performing team, uh, we see a balance of who's talking at the moment. Like if you just turn off the audio and watch who's talking. On a lower-performing team, we see more of the, the tendency one person standing to dominate the team. So the actor used three different types of behavior on that team. And one of them is uh, withholding effort from the group. Any of you think of that? So you're on a, imagine you're on a rowing team and there's one per, you're rowing really hard, one person's sitting back smoking a cigarette. You're, you're not going to row as hard. So it's not just the lack of that person's contribution, it's that it resets the norm for the entire team. So the whole team becomes slackers or they're their morale is certainly affected by having one slacker there, one person who's withholding effort. Another one is uh, the one that you guys listed. Uh, uh, violating important interpersonal norms was the, the technical term they used. So violating important interpersonal norms. You know, being a jerk. If person A is a jerk to person B, and person C will start acting like a jerk to person D. Because every team has agreements, and you're whether you write them down or not, and doing that resets the team agreements, that you're modeling behavior for the other people on the team uh, when people are acting like jerks. Uh, and a third one was uh, expressing negative affect, so affect with an A. Uh, so that's so you think of like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh, oh, someone wrote incessant negativity, uh, constantly being negative, being you know, as a, as a way of going through life, you probably know some of these people, and the rest of a team, you can watch their faces. Uh, you know, turn off the audio, just watch their faces. Everyone else's face starts to do the same thing. You know, they start to feel, they all start to develop a, a negative outlook on things. This study uh, was done by Will Phelps, and if the footnotes aren't here, then write to me later and I'll send you the study. You can actually hear the guy who did this, uh, if you listen to the radio program, This American Life, he talks about how he uh, got people, how he got the actor to do these behaviors. The way he got withholding effort from the group, by the way, uh, the actor brought a Blackberry. So the team was about to start on some work, and the actor uh, brought out his Blackberry, and the whole team lost motivation just by the, the actor doing that one thing. So you might think about what are the effects of these in your uh, when you have your team meetings, your scrum meetings, uh, are these electronic articles, and I love them, I love my BlackBerry, but are they interfering with what your team uh, is doing in, if you're using them in meetings? Especially these time box meetings in Scrum where we focus on clear objective. Here's Dilbert on that negative affect. So what does this mean for your organization? Now, my experience is, is backed up by, uh, this is, no, I forgot the name of the guy from uh, who, at saferpatients.com, who uh, he w discovers that organizations are uh, like hospitals, uh, these things are not happening because of technology problems, these problems are not happening because of process problems, uh, these things are happening because of people problems. And it seems like no matter what we do, we try and we try and put probably disproportionate effort uh, in certain directions. And it seems like there's always going to be 3% who are, gonna, who are going to uh, sabotage your efforts. And they're not the disagreeable people necessarily. And in fact, they're usually not. The disagreeable people become your, your best allies if you're involved in an organizational change effort. Uh, 
those people are great. So those participants in my class who like to argue and disagree with things, those I love those people because they're those people are going to be the change agents when they go back to work. And once you've convinced them uh, that there's, once you've proven to them that there's a better way of doing things, they'll advocate for that. Uh, but this three percent are more like the the people when you're not looking, they'll sabotage you. When you're not looking, they'll you know with the air air tires and things like that. And so this is a tough problem for organizations. Now in Scrum. I'm not going to talk about Scrum that much. Yeah, I think it's just 3%. It looks like a lot more because they have a disproportionate impact. But I think there's, I think most people, if you create the right circumstances, you want to be part of a good organization and want to move things forward. On the Scrum team, we have a small focus group of people. Uh, we don't have a externally defined role on the Scrum team, other than the three roles, which are product owner, team, and Scrum master. Uh, if I'm on a scrum team, then I'm responsible for negotiating my role with the rest of the team on an ongoing, continuous basis, rather than having a static hierarchy on the team. And if you remember the autonomy principle, then we, we need this team to be uh, held responsible and given autonomy at the same time. So they commit to goals at the beginning of, let's say, a two-week iteration. And then we take our hands off and let them self-organize to achieve the goals. And then we expect at the sprint review meeting, we expect to see a demonstration of a potentially shippable product increment. And they're going to have to self-organize during the sprint. And they'll probably make mistakes. And then they do their own retrospective and they're responsible for their process. So this is how we can start to create an environment of team flow. Uh, if we're doing Scrum, for instance. Another aspect of this is co-location. A uh, co-located team will nearly always outperform a geographically dispersed team. Now, if you have geographic disbursement, then deal with it. And we, we make tools that will help you deal with it. Uh, I would still encourage you to get together physically as much as you can. Get people into one room. I wanted to show you first the ugliest team room I've ever seen. Now, this is a cross-functional team. So we've got business people and technical people working together on this one team. They've collectively committed to goals. A little bit nicer team room here. This is uh, near where I live in Seattle, Washington. You can probably tell from this guy. This is the team that builds Scrumworks. And you notice that they're, they're right now they're swarming. There's a, a time-lapse video you can see on YouTube, a day in the life of a, of, of a Scrum team. So you can see their team room uh, as the team interacts throughout the day. And you see at various times they're, they're up like this. They're swarming on something. Other times they're quiet. Uh, other times they're, they're goofing off. You know, other times the energy level drops. You can see it's acting like one organism together. These teams take time to learn how to perform well together. You may have heard of this Bruce Tuckman uh, model of, of teams going, going from well, initially they're forming. You know, forming teams are expecting micromanagement. So a forming team is expecting someone to tell them what to do. Uh, we want to get them out of that. And this, it's going to involve some, some differences on the team. Uh, we need heterogeneous teams for high performance on complex work, and so there's going to be differences. There's going to be conflict, and uh, we call that storming. It's a normal and natural thing, and we want, need to create an environment of psychological safety so that these differences happen in a safe environment, so people don't feel abused, you know, and people are still comfortable sharing their differences with each other in a healthy way. And then you know, norming team is when people are performing about the way you expect the team to. Of course, I'm not interested in norming teams at all. I'm interested in the high performing teams. I can create the environment for high performing teams. And high performance seems to take uh, maybe months or a couple years. Uh, one, the evidence uh, from Keith Sawyer in, the, in Group Genius, uh, based on what he's looked at, it seems to take one to two years for a team to reach its peak performance. And something like three or four years, the performance seems to drop off again. Uh, you might think about your favorite band. Why were those those first three albums were so great? And then what happened to the fourth and fifth albums? And of course, there are exceptions to this. And, and most of those exceptions involved, uh, they went back through storming again. Uh, for instance, the, the Beatles. I, I don't think their innovative work started until something like, they've been together for five years or so. And that's when they were truly innovating. So they've been an exception to that and that team had lots of conflict on it as well. So what do you think? We went through those different personality traits. Hope you remember some of them. Uh, a team of about the size of a scrum team, 
you know, about four or five people. They studied this again and again. They used 61 different teams of engineering grad students and gave them the same complex assignment. And uh, based on their personalities, they made some predictions uh, about which teams would do better. And based on your life experience, I'm wondering what you think. What's the right number of extroverts for a team of you know, four or five people? What do you think the sweet spot was? Two or three, maybe three, maybe two. Yeah, your intuition is right on. Uh, it, it was a... Uh, yeah, about half, about half a team. You know, one or two extroverts seem to be. So the teams without any extroverts tended to underperform. Teams that were all extroverts also underperformed. It was the teams with that, that balance uh, that did well. Now, what about teams where everyone agrees with each other? Does that sound like a high-performing state for complex work to you? Interesting thing is that they actually study this empirically. Yeah, the team where people agree. Um, Exactly. You need the dissent on a, for complex work. For simple work, uh, where everyone's agreeable, that works fine. They spend less time in storming. You know, they just get together and they, and they just do the work. The problem is that they do the wrong work. And, and they're not able to see. They, they get into group think. I thought point number three was interesting. Uh, they expected, the experimenters expected to find a link between conscientiousness or individual conscientiousness and team performance. Uh, they didn't find that. They, for something about the team environment, seemed to mask differences in individual uh, conscientiousness. I, based on what I've seen, and I train uh, Scrum, I've probably how many teams have I trained in Scrum? A lot. Uh, I see, it seems like the team environment uh, masks differences in individual performance or in individual conscientiousness. So something, something about the camaraderie, uh, the enjoyment of working in a team environment. And when we set it up right, when we set up a safe environment, the team has autonomy, and they're doing meaningful work. Uh, so I found that interesting. And here we see... Uh, too few extroverts didn't do as well. Too many extroverts didn't do as well. Somewhere in the middle here is the, the sweet spot. And, uh, of course, you have to assume, uh, does grad student behavior translate into adult behavior? Uh, there's, maybe it doesn't because we know 20-year-olds aren't, aren't, haven't reached the level of maturity that a 30-year-old will, in, in, even in terms of just their basic personality traits. Of course, we don't know that until, of course, <laughs> we think we're adults when we're 20. This is something you know intuitively, which is also proven empirically. We need diversity. We need dissent. We need differences. We need heterogeneous teams for the kind of work that's coming up in the next century, already happening probably in your environment. You're not doing the same thing again and again. You're not doing predictable work, I hope. Uh, I, I hope that your work is something that's where there's an amount of novelty and opportunity for innovation, and if not, then uh, change it. Change your environment. I promised you we'd talk about aviation. What do you think about this? The pilot, the senior ranking officer, should operate the controls of the airplane for maximum safety, or the junior ranking officer? Statistically, which way do we have fewer pilot errors? There's, yeah, and I haven't checked the backing research for this. This is based on uh, Malcolm Gladwell's research. But uh, evidently, when the junior ranking officer is operating the controls, uh, statistically fewer pilot errors are made. Why is that happening? What's the reason for that? Uh, consider the possibility, uh, what's the direction of feedback? Yeah, they are sharing the work. Now, what happened, in fact, we can look at the world's worst plane crash in terms of number of people who died. Uh, for a great example of this, uh, there was a plane, a fully loaded 747, already on the runway uh, that was also being used as a taxiway. And then there was another plane getting ready to take off. The junior ranking officer was aware of a problem, uh, but didn't state it assertively. 
senior ranking officer didn't listen very well, and together, uh, so they took off. I mean, they, they failed as a team, and also there was an error made by the tower. The tower didn't confirm that they understood, and so they tried to take off with another plane still on the runway, and hundreds of people died because of, was it a technology problem? Ultimately, I, I, I assert that no matter what it looks like at first, it's always a people problem. So the people problem in this, in this environment, uh, airlines figured this out. This is part of the reason that air travel has gotten safer over the past 15 years. They, they realized that you know, the planes are not crashing because of technology problems. Planes are crashing because of people problems. In fact, the Navy's figured this out also. And we'll go through some examples of Let's talk about what the people problems in these situations. Yeah, it was the communication, the coordination. So it's the habits of how we work with each other. So in this example, a long time ago, uh, it's a 747 that uh, due to a maintenance problem uh, broke up mechanically. And they lost not only the vertical stabilizer, and the, which includes the rudder, they also lost the hydraulic systems controlling all the wing surfaces. So the pilot stick does not do anything in this situation. The pilot stick, move it backwards, forwards, it has no effect on the plane because the control surfaces, the airlines, the elevators, there's no rudder anymore, have no effect on the plane's movement. The pilots together as a team, the crew, figured out that they could still steer the airplane. How did they do that? They used the engines use differential thrust. They could still control the amount of thrust going to these engines. They could steer the airplane. They could control its attitude and altitude to some degree by with differential thrust. Now, that was impressive. They managed to do that. Uh, unfortunately, and let's give them credit for that, uh, tragically, they still crashed. And you can see where they crashed. While they were figuring this stuff out, uh, their teamwork was something less than optimal. They were in a panicked state during this event. And you can actually, the recordings are online if you're really, uh, if you have a, if you're able to tolerate listening to such things. Uh, you can hear what's going on. The pilots are not, are not dealing with each other in the most effective way. And so even though it looks like a technology problem, uh, ultimately they crashed because of people problems. And I'm not saying this to, I want to give the impression that they're at fault for this. Uh, what they did was heroic and impressive. Uh, we'll go through another example. Same thing happened a few years later to this DC-10. The DC-10 has all the hydraulic lines running through the tail of the aircraft. Uh, it's, so we're trying to have, we had, the hydraulic lines are very important because they're required to control the wing surfaces on the, uh, on the aircraft. And they're so important that we make three different redundant hydraulic lines, but they all run through the tail. And so when the tail engine exploded, uh, the pilots, the, the crew, lost control of the wing surfaces again. So once again, the same situation. The stick has no effect on what the plane's doing. And the, the rudder has no effect. And the only thing that has any effect is the thrust of the two engines. Now this time, things happened a little bit differently. The one thing, they had the benefit of knowing about the the previous crash, the JAL-123 crash. And also, an expert pilot happened to be in the back of the plane, and it came forward, and they worked together as a team. In fact, when they listened to the recording, they're surprised how calm they all seem. Uh, they worked together as a team, and were able to learn how to fly the plane, even uh, it, you know, without going into pure panic. Now, they're not, a couple times they're joking, they're even, uh, so they can, you can tell that they're, they're not in a completely panicked state. They're certainly not relaxed. Uh, but they're a little bit closer to that flow state that we're, that we're looking for uh, in a team. And they were able to gain some control of the airplane. And they were able to bring it in for a more controlled crash. Now, they still crashed and people still died. But they saved hundreds of lives uh, through by solving this technology problem, by looking at it as a people problem, by working together as a team. And so airlines are learning from this, and they figured out that, you know, it's not, what they used to call this cockpit resource management, then they realized, you know, it's not about the cockpit, it's about the crew. It's about how people work together, and they're actually changing the way they train their pilots now. 
and this is called crew resource management, the training that they give their pilots. You have more resources available to you if you're interested in such things. I think it's fascinating. Same thing happened to this flight crew. Now, this was a cargo plane, so there weren't hundreds of lives at stake. What happened? Terrorists shot the plane with a surface-to-air missile, and they lost all hydraulic controls over the plane. And now, of course, they knew about the previous times, and they've been trained in this is much more recently. They've been trained in crew resource management, and they worked together as a team once again, and they managed to land it safely. There was still damage to the aircraft, but this time no one got hurt, and they managed to land it. And you can look at uh, what happened in that case. We all about that. So it wasn't about the captain controlling everything. Uh, it was about people working together as a team. Of course, the captain has the ultimate authority, uh, but we're not going to be effective unless we work as a team. And that means that the junior ranking officers have got to learn to be more assertive, and the senior officers have got to learn to listen better. Uh, I hope you're thinking about your company now and how you can change things to make it more of an environment for innovation. The specific skills they train pilots on Stick here. Now, what's great about this is that hospitals are figuring this out. They're just starting to figure this out. Uh, they haven't solved this problem yet, and uh, patients die, frankly, you know, often because of people problems. Because of uh, you can read all about hospital safety. Uh, a lot of times, it's, it's how people work together as a team. And there's a tradition of how people used to work together. Uh, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to most effective hospitals or safer hospitals. Uh, but they're learning from crew resource management. They're learning from what airlines are doing. And if you write to me later, I'll send you uh, one experiment in that. They did a, a teaching hospital in Boston area. And they were able to, uh, before the training, uh, only 65% of residents reported that they would feel comfortable telling a senior clinician that his plan was unsafe. Uh, through training, they increased that to 94%. So 94% of residents uh, now felt comfortable telling a senior clinician. So it's, it's our assumptions, right? We think that we're not supposed to speak up. Uh, they, we think that it's, it's meant to be, uh, it's going to be taken personally. Of course, we need to learn skills in doing this that don't cause offense, that don't cause people to retreat into their uh, defensiveness. Um, and yeah, we're talking about nurses in particular. Nurses need to speak up to... Um, uh, to senior, by clinicians, I'm referring to all people working in the hospital, doctors, nurses, etc. Uh, so this behavior is expected and demanded of fellow crew members to improve safety, and it's not subordinate or a personal attack. And these are the things that we've got to start teaching in our organizations if we're going to create. Uh, you know, we need we need bidirectional communication. We can't just have it come down from on top. We need to be able to to communicate in both directions. If our especially large organizations struggle with this, if we're going to have effective organizations, and it's even harder in geographically dispersed organizations where we make a lot of assumptions about other people. So let's talk about team. Oh yeah. By the way, so how to make this training work? Theoretical training didn't work. Uh, what worked was practical training in simulated situations. And these are the things that uh, Collabnet is developing in our own the way that we train teams to work together, uh, put them in situations where we don't, want just, we don't want you to just tell us what you think someone should do. We want you to do it and find out what's uncomfortable to you about doing that and, and challenge those. I mean, those are your personal impediments. Here's an example of how airlines are training their flight crews. So now we'll come back to come back to flow again. We want to create flow on a team. Uh, do you remember what causes flow? What contributes to flow? Some of the things. One of them was clear goals. Here's an IEEE, IEEE study from the 80s. The biggest barrier to team performance is unclear objectives. 
so clear goals. So what we're trying to do in Scrum, we want to have a sprint planning meeting with clear, clear obvious goals, measurable goals. If a 10-year-old came back to your sprint review meeting, we'll be able to tell you whether you met the goals or not. We want to come up with clear goals, measurable goals, short-term goals. The whole team can see a clear, bright finish line that we can swarm around those, those challenges and work towards those goals. And so that's the objective. The Scrum Master's got to start creating that kind of clarity in the sprint planning meeting. And based on what you remember, so uh, S23 Ayers wrote appropriate challenge. They've got to be hard goals. Yeah, we can't be, uh, we've got to be challenged by these goals. If they're easy goals, we're not going to get into the flow state. We're not going to get the, the full capability of a team. So the team's got to agree to this, of course. You have to own these challenges or else they're not meaningful goals. Uh, but yeah, I encourage teams to do uh, something you didn't think you could do before. Uh, that means we have to take risks. Risks lead to flow. If we, it's something we're always going to succeed at, we're not as likely to get into the flow state. Uh, jazz performance teams, I'm sorry, they are, they are teams, aren't they? Uh, get into the state of flow more often during performance than they do during rehearsals. If you're seriously interested in group flow and collaboration, another place to, uh, to learn skills in that is through theater improv. Improv teams have, uh, have collaboration. These guys know collaboration like no one else does. And so yeah, if you can get your scrum team to do uh, an improv class, if you're in a city that has that, most big cities have something like that. Uh, yeah, it sounds silly, but I think they'll enjoy it, and I think they'll work better as a team. We, the other part of this is that uh, if we take in too much work in terms of the quantity, we will think that we're more creative, but external observers will observe will say, no, actually, you weren't as creative. So that's something else we have to look at. So Scrum Master is a sheepdog. The team needs to pull in the appropriate amount of work so that we have the appropriate challenge during the sprint. Uh, the conditions for flow are autonomy. And this is, in fact, written up in the very first paper on Scrum new, new product development game. Autonomy, self-transcendence, and cross-fertilization. When we get, in other words, cross-functional teams, different types of thinking in one place. Now, if we need autonomy for flow, what does that have to do with a team? Because on a team, as an individual has less autonomy. And there's a there's conflict between these two objectives. The teams that learn how to do this are the ones that will innovate. Another part of this is uh, because of the issues on teams, how we work with each other, we need an environment of psychological safety uh, because there are going to be differences and teams need to be able to give each other feedback. So instead of a performance appraisal at the end of the year from someone who doesn't know what you do most of the time, uh, every two weeks on a scrum team, we are we're giving each other feedback. We're giving each other feedback right then and there. And we've got to create the environment of the Scrum Master has to create the environment of psychological safety where this can happen uh, without stigma, without fear, and without long-term repercussions on one's career. So that's a bit about team performance. Uh, how well the team does is also determined by the organization that they're in. And we don't have as much time to talk about that uh, during this webinar. This is a longer webinar we, we cut short to fit into the hour that you have. What are the, so the waters that the team swims in, the, the organization, uh, what is the kind of organization that's going to lead to innovation? As, and, and this gets harder and harder the larger the organization. Uh, you want to read more about that? Uh, there is my article, Seven Obstacles to Enterprise Agility. I've worked with lots of teams and lots of organizations, and I can probably save you some time. Uh, by at least giving names to the things that you're going to run into. And also look at what are your, your company's HRM practices, your human resources practices. They're probably not the, the root of the problem, uh, but often are, they have something to do with the problem or their re reflection of the Tayloristic thinking, uh, you know, the BF Scanner type thinking uh, from the previous century. 
So, uh, to wrap up, uh, you know a little bit about Scrum, I hope. If you don't, then please uh, download my Scrum reference card or take one of our classes. Uh, Scrum is a framework. It doesn't tell us how to solve any of these things. Uh, I think ingenuity is more important in the future. We used to talk about hyper-productivity with Scrum. I think that's not as important now as, or I think it's going to become less and less important, this productivity concept. I really want you to focus on ingenuity, environment for team ingenuity in your teams and your organizations. And there's a lot we can learn. We don't have to reinvent the wheel because it's just been studied quite a bit in other disciplines. Do we have a few minutes left for Q&A or, or is that it? We've got, uh, we've got about four minutes left to go and we can certainly go over if we get a few more questions. Um, um, don't forget everyone, if you've got any questions for Michael, go ahead and you post them in the uh, event chat box down below. Otherwise, one question, um, can you discuss uh, your discussion points for any, uh, oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was a question for you. So yeah, just uh, uh, any, uh, any main ideas. Um, over the main points. Yeah, I right. guess they are uh, focus on, let's see if I can recap. And by the way, I agree, uh, Drive by Dan Pink is a great book about motivation. There's also a, a, a 10 or, it's about a 10 or 15 minute YouTube video. There's two of them uh, that are really good to explain, to encapsulate these things if you don't have time to read the entire books on the topic. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through, yeah, individual performance is um, related to IQ, I, somewhat. It's related more to personality. And we, there are empirical models of personality, which are worth knowing if you're involved with uh, trying to create an environment for team ingenuity. Uh, group performance is uh, more important, I think, than team performance because innovations come out of, I mean, the idea of the lone genius turns out to be a myth. We, we could create small groups that can perform, small cross-functional groups with different personalities and inherent conflict on those groups and environment of safety for those groups. and. Uh, the, uh, and training can help with this, uh, you, I believe. That I don't think a lot of that training is available, but we're working on that. Uh, and the airline in industry has discovered this 15 years ago. Uh, what else? The organization that the team is in uh, has a big factor on what the team's performance will be, and there are quite a few, especially in large uh, established organizations with lots of baggage, there are lots of impediments to, uh, to team performance. Uh, and you can read more about those things on uh, my Gantt head article, Seven Obstacles to, to, uh, to Enterprise Agility, and also my HR article, and about 50 other blog posts that I've written. How's that for summary? Sounds good. And uh, a question, uh, someone mentioned something about a longer uh, webcast. Um, if you're interested in a follow-up webcast to this, go ahead and Post, uh, post that in the chat window there as well, too. Um, we'll consider that for a follow-up webcast maybe next month. So uh, we are about out of time. So, uh, Michael, thanks for joining us today. It's been a great presentation, probably one of the best webcasts I've heard in some time. Uh, not all focused on technology and, and a lot of good feedback. Thank you. Look forward to hearing from sure. you all. Alrighty. Well, thanks everyone who joined us today, and thanks to ev to everyone who helped put this webcast on. And I look forward to seeing you at our next webcast uh, next week. So goodbye, everyone.